in the name of the one God. Amen. In the Gospel this morning, John writes, Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. In the Gospel last week, we heard, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Next week, we will hear the familiar story of Jesus in the temple. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Signs. In each of these stories, we see signs of revelation. Jesus revealed. We live our daily lives surrounded by signs road signs, billboards, church signs, opportunities, cautions, signs of welcome, signs marking boundaries, signs that help, and signs that confuse. So many signs. I began to wonder which ones I notice and why I notice them. I notice signs that give me information that I might need, and I notice signs that answer a question that I might have. My attention might be drawn to a clever sign or a funny one, but if it doesn't reveal something important to me, I ignore it. In scripture, signs are an event, an act, a manifestation that signals God's presence or intention. They can be miraculous or spectacular. They can be natural phenomena like rainbows or sunsets. They could be a guiding star or an infant born in a manger. In scripture, signs and miracles take place through God's spirit and power. My Bible dictionary explains that God executes God's salvific will through the deeds of individuals specifically gifted with God's spirit and power. God is the catalyst. God gives the gift. In Exodus, God speaks to Moses and turns his staff into a snake. This said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, has appeared to you. Many of the prophets are gifted with God's spirit and power to accomplish that which God requires of them, and so are we. Today, the gospel is a miracle story. Jesus turns water into wine, the story gives us many ways to focus our attention, to pique our curiosity. Good stories in general and Bible stories always are written in layers. We can read the story and accept what we read without question. And we can read the story and wonder what is the story telling us about the context who first heard the story, and who was there at the wedding. And we can imagine the story in our own time, in our own lives. What is there for us to learn? What is the writer telling us, and what has God revealed? Jesus did this, the first of his signs, and revealed his glory. Is there significance to the reference that the wedding took place on the third day? Is it important that the disciples were invited? Have we heard many concerns for the way that Jesus responds to his mother? That seems to be a big question for lots of people who read this story. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? 
A loving and dutiful son would not speak to his mother like that. And why does she assume that Jesus will fix the problem for the sake of the hosts who will be embarrassed if they run out of good wine? And is it significant that the miracle turns water into wine? Is that a reference to our Eucharist? These are all the questions that we could be asking of this story. And I have read this story of the wedding at Cana so many times, like all of you. I know it is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. I have almost always focused on the miracle, though. The miracle of changing water into wine. I have always placed the power to perform that miracle in Jesus because I know who he is. I overlook the presence of God in the miracle, in the sign. God is the catalyst. God chose this time and event to reveal Jesus. It is God who gifts God's spirit and power to Jesus who is then called to act as an agent of God's will on behalf of God's people. So this miracle was not about obedience to Jesus' mother or about saving his hosts from embarrassment. Signs are windows through which God is revealed. Signs are not an end in themselves. They are never meant only to amaze or to prove something. For us to attend to the miracle in this story and miss what God reveals is simply curiosity in something that is unusual. So what is it that God intends us to understand? My curiosity about that was sparked by a brief conversation with Elise last week. She mentioned the three gospel accounts that we have heard and will hear about the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the revelation of who Jesus is. In each, there is an element of time, and I think more importantly, an informed audience. When Jesus was baptized, John the Baptist was preaching about the one who is coming the one for whom he waited. And John recognized Jesus. If not immediately, then when he heard the voice from heaven, you are my beloved. Did everyone hear that voice? Did everyone know? At the wedding, Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. Who is it who understands? The passage ends and his disciples believed in him. And in the gospel next week, Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is given him to read. The spirit of the Lord is on me. He returns the scroll and says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What is it that God wants us to understand? That Jesus is the sign of God's salvific will. That Jesus is the sign of God's relationship with us. That God reveals God's self through the ordinary events of our lives. Those who witness these signs that God has bestowed upon Jesus are those who expect to find him, to recognize him. In each of these stories, it is God who acts. Jesus, God's beloved, is God's sign to us of God's continuing presence in our lives. Jesus received God's spirit and power at his baptism, and so do we. God's power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Do we believe it? 
Do we see the signs and know that God is calling us and empowering us to do the work begun in Jesus and continued in every generation in whom Christ has been known? The kingdom of God exists in us. May we have the will to make it known. Amen.